Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cat Talk Radio. I'm your host, Molly DeVos, and today is our veterinary episode, and we're joined by Dr. Brian Hurley. He's the National Medical Director for AmeriVet Veterinary Partners. So welcome again, Dr. Hurley. Oh, it's great to be back. I yeah. always look forward to our monthly talks. Today, we're going to talk all about dental disease and taking care of your cat's teeth because that's a really important topic. You know, we're told by our veterinarians that we should take our cats to the vet and have annual cleanings, a lot like we do our, our own teeth, of course. And that doesn't happen in most households. In fact, in most households, they say less than 50% of people take their cats to the vet at all. They kind of wait until something serious is brewed up. And that's because it's so stressful on the cat. And when it's stressful on the cat, it's stressful on the owners. But you know, another reason people don't get their cat's teeth cleaned as often as they should is because of the expense. I, I cannot find teeth cleaning in our community for under about $600, which is, you know, which is a lot and, and not everybody can afford to do that annually. And so start off with telling us why is it so expensive to get our cat's teeth cleaned? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, and I think the, the, the idea or the cost of doing the dental and even doing extractions really are going to parallel what happens on the human side. On the veterinary side, unfortunately, in order to perform a dental appropriately, we need our patients to be still and quiet. We're putting very sharp instruments very close to their eyes and to their body. And we just need to be able to get into the mouth. We don't want to get bit. So we do have to administer anesthesia, which adds to the cost. In order to do anesthesia, it's, uh, standard medicine to do pre-op blood work to make sure the patient can handle the anesthetic uh, procedure. And then we also will place IV catheter, IV fluids. And these are things that we don't need to do on the human side. Um, and so that adds significantly to the, the cost because these procedures, uh, just a basic cleaning can last about 45 minutes Wow. And that's not including doing any other procedures. And part of that is just think about the number of teeth. You have to address each teeth separately. So in our adult cats, we have 30 teeth. In our dogs, 42. And in us, we have 32. And oh. so, um, you know, and so you have to address each one individually and scale all sides and in between. And the procedure itself is the same uh, as what your dentist does to us as humans it's just we have to do it while they're asleep yeah but what's different is cats don't get cavities right they're you're not in there filling cavities like they do with us correct you know we don't see cavities what we do see is uh tooth resorption mm -hmm. so it kind of you know when i used to uh, be in practice and i was describing that resorptive lesion that I was seeing in the cat, um, it is a hole that eventually will work its way from inside the tooth out and break through the enamel. Mm. The unfortunate thing is when it gets to that stage, A, they're very painful. They hurt, just think, think about a cavity. I mean, it's yeah. not the same, but it has that pain. Uh, if something touches it, if food touches it, uh, and so, unfortunately, we can't fill them like our dentist would. Uh, usually, once it ruptures through the uh, enamel, it's an extraction to solve the problem. Yeah. And tooth resorption, that's a, such an interesting thing. Is that a, I mean, does tooth resorption happen in people or is this just a dog and cat thing? The, the true tooth resorption uh, is, is more a cat thing. You know, really? we don't talk about resorptive lesions necessarily on the, the canine side at the same process as what happens on the cat. And we can fill things on the dog to, to help help their teeth. In cats, this is a process we see it, between, you know, it affects 30 to 70 percent of the cats can have 
evidence of resorptive lesions at varying stages. Like I said, just because you might identify it on uh, an x-ray of the, the teeth uh, doesn't necessarily mean you have to jump right to extracting that tooth. You want to make sure you kind of maintain good uh, oral health to try to slow down the progression because we know once it breaks through that enamel, uh, we have to extract the, the, the tooth. And oftentimes it affects multiple teeth over time. Yeah. And it, so when a cat's in there for, for a cleaning, do you do x-rays like you do on people? Absolutely. I mean, okay. so, you know, once we get them anesthetized, the very next thing that we do is we'll take a full set of uh, x-rays of the mouth, just like human dentists do. Now they tend to do it once a year, not at both. I mean, you know, a lot of people go twice a year. Uh, but the idea there is, it's like everything else. We see the crown of the tooth, you know, and we can see visually what those teeth might look like, some easier than others. Uh, but there's a lot of things happening at the root level that's going to potentially need to be addressed before it becomes a, a more major issue. And so that's why, again, the, the procedure is a little more expensive because we do need to take those uh, full mouth x-rays. Yeah. And now, so I did an interesting thing. I, I did the base pause DNA test, which also is, you know, it's a cheek swab in the cat. And so it's also analyzing the bacteria in the mouth. And I did it when I first got Pico. So he was, you know, he was probably four months old when I first did it to, to get a baseline. And then I did it again when he was two years old. So the first one came back saying his mouth was really healthy. He had no dental issues at all. At two years old, I had not taken him for a cleaning yet. It came back saying that he was in a high risk category for tooth resorption and dental disease. So I rushed him into the vet to, you know, like, oh my gosh, what has changed? I thought tooth resorption was more of a disease that affects some cats and, and not all cats. Is that true or is that a condition that develops in any cat? So let's take it from a couple of levels, right? Genetics and hereditary processes really, I don't think come into play as much with oral health as other disease processes because every person and every cat, every dog is going to have bacteria in their mouth. And it's that bacteria that starts certain processes like gingivitis and periodontal disease, stomatitis, right down to the tooth resorption. Tooth resorption, no one knows why it occurs. There's, you know, there are theories out there that uh, people have looked at, but still today, no one really can say, okay, this is what causes tooth resorption. We know it's a combination of the cat, the, the bacteria, and, and just the nature of how the tooth is responding to what's happening on a daily basis over time. Um, you know, the unfortunate thing and why we do see it so high, think about what we do. We brush our teeth twice a day, at least, um, at least once a day, most people. Um, and our pets typically are neglected in having brushing teeth, mainly because it's not a simple process. Right. <laughs> They're trying to bite the toothbrush. They're trying to bite our fingers. It's not a pleasurable thing sometimes. And so it's a little harder. And so because we're not clearing that plaque, so plaque is a film that, that's on our teeth that harbor bacteria. That bacteria normally is handled fine by the body, but if the plaque's not consistently being removed, then you start to see the progression of that bacteria being pushed under the gum, which then creates that redness and that inflammation or gingivitis. And then that's when things start to progress. In our pets, because we're not routinely removing that film, because the saliva and the enzymes and the minerals that are contained in that saliva, along with what's in the mouth naturally, 
once that plaque then hardens, it becomes either tartar, that brown discoloration, or calculus. Those are the two phrases that we use. Um, you know, once we get to that hardened phase, that's usually what, for most people, indicates the, the need for the dental because they get the bad breath. They might see the redness. And it's the bad breath that oftentimes goes, whoo, you know, because it's affecting that bond. You know, yeah. that with bad breath, you don't want in your face. Right. <laughs> or if they're sitting on your lap and you can smell, you know, oh, man, what's that smell? And it's the teeth. All of a sudden, you're pushing them away. And so, you know, we want them to be on the lap and getting hugs. And, and that's why it's so important for the, the, the dental procedures and kind of coming full circle back to the cost. One of the best ways to minimize resorptive lesions and dental disease is having annual cleanings. And I know it's tough because of the cost, but we know how important it can be in preventing some of these other things because we're more reactive than being proactive. Right, exactly. And why is stomatitis um, always linked to dental disease? What Tell us what's happening there. So with, with stomatitis itself, you, you kind of have a progression. The, the good news is, you know, stomatitis isn't the most common thing that we see. So you start, all of us start with just the inflammation of the gums. It's the plaque, the bacteria creates um, redness to the gums. Depending on the severity, you can have some discomfort, you can have some bleeding, those type of things. When you don't address it at that level, and that, you know, sometimes when you just start to see some redness, you're at kind of that stage one periodontal disease, you're, you get in, if you don't get in there and start to clean the teeth, then things start to happen under the gums because that bacteria starts to affect the soft tissue, starts to affect the, the bones. So you can start to get bone breakdown, which then leads to loose teeth. Um, in addition, you start to get mobility of the teeth. You can get even more pain response. You might start to see these resorptive lesions forming, which are, you know, really painful. Um, and then there is the time that you're trying to address and you can usually reverse those things. Stomatitis now is more of what they believe is more an autoimmune disease. I always told clients, it's kind of like the body is treating the teeth as a foreign oh. substance, okay? And so typically we see gingivitis and just varying stages of periodontal disease, mouth infections, things like that. They can be treated with antibiotics or a good teeth cleaning. Get the bad teeth out, things heal, all's right in the world. Stomatitis is a disease process that we see that can still begin with gingivitis because it does get really severe inflammation of the gums, but the body itself is, is uh, impacting this process and it affects the entire mouth. It can get under the tongue, it can get in the palate, it can get in the back of the mouth because there's just so much inflammation. You know, they've tied it to other viral diseases like leukemia and AIDS. Um, but again, no one's really said this causes stomatitis in every instance. Um, so it's one of those advanced disease processes. And unfortunately, why we can try to minimize pain with medication and, and use antibiotics to try to slow down the progression, stomatitis, true stomatitis, uh, oftentimes the, the treatment is get all the teeth out of the mouth. Um, and you know, after five to 10 to 14 days, um, the pain goes away and the cat can live a happy, healthy life. Is that right? Even with the teeth gone, um, they do fine. And I had, you know, I'd heard that we get cats in the shelter that, that are diagnosed with stomatitis and it's of course, extremely hard to get them adopted because I've always been told that it's not curable. It's something that they're living with forever. Right. Right. And it's hard to manage. And we do try some of those autoimmune, uh, medications too, 
because the last thing you really do want to do is go in and, and remove all the teeth. Yeah. But stomatitis is really, really painful. And if you can't control it with medication, um, these cats, they're not eating, they're not wanting to drink. All these things come into play um, and, and they'll truly just go off food. Where when you're dealing with gingivitis or just periodontal disease or even resorptive lesions, you know, the thing that uh, pet owners should be watching for in the cat, because most of the time people aren't going in going, hey, let me look at the teeth and, oh, I see tartar and I'm going to go to the vet. Usually what triggers something's going on is that behavior on how they're approaching their food. Right. When they pick it up, do they drop it? And then try to pick it up again, drop it, because they're trying to position it right in their mouth to be able to chew. Or do you see them putting the food in the mouth and you see them kind of rolling yeah. it around, trying to find which side is not is going to allow them to chew it? Or they might just swallow whole. They can't chew, so they just start swallowing whole. Or you might see them tilt their head because they're trying to get it to the right place in their mouth. Those are the things that, that pet owners could look for drooling um is another common thing that we'll see i mean bad breath like i said that's yeah sometimes a tell sign that there's tartar in the mouth yeah and cats are you know cats are notorious for not showing pain so it's not like they're running around going ow ow i have a toothache <laughs> you know you a lot of times you don't know until it's too late i i had a cat that stopped eating you know got real finicky and he would eat one food one day and then the next day he'd, he'd go, uh, uh I'm not eating that stuff. And then I'd change it and he'd eat. And then the second meal, he'd say, nope, I'm not eating that. And what right. was happening was he was identifying the pain with that flavor. And so in his mind, he's thinking, well, that stuff makes my mouth hurt. So I'm not eating it. And then when I would introduce a new flavor or texture, he'd try it. And when that hurt, he wouldn't eat it. And so it was just a constant trying to find something he would eat. And when he hadn't been, he wasn't picky his whole life. So I knew something was wrong. You know, it was clear. And I think dental disease is truly that one process that, you know, when you're getting these resorptive lesions or you're getting severe dental disease, this is the one that cats can't hide mm. because the food is going to be the telltale thing that generates the pain. And any of us that have ever had a cavity or a broken tooth and tried to drink or try to eat something, you know it. Yeah. Because those nerves are so sensitive when they're fresh. I, I don't care how strong you are. You're going to know it. You know something's going on because it's going to get your attention. Yeah. And it's and cats, attention. cats have nerve endings in their teeth, just like we do. Yeah, there's, there's blood vessels and, and nerves going right up that uh, yeah. the center of the tooth. So when we have those kinds of dental issues, we can assume that our cat is feeling a, the same level of discomfort that, that we would feel? Absolutely. As we've talked a lot, I, I always try to take the process that we're talking about um, and any time you know, I'm asked about that pain level. Are they feeling pain? What kind of pain are they feeling? As we always discuss it, they're not going to tell me. So I always kind of relate it to if I had, or yeah. I know somebody who went through this, what did they convey to me? And I then say, well, if that's how we feel with that same process, our pets must feel the same and that's what drives my decisions on pain medications and things like that, because it's all I got to go with. Right. You know? Sure. Sure. You know, when, when Pico was a kitten, when I first got him, I thought I'm going to train him to let me brush his teeth. And the way I was going to do it, I got one of those little, you know, baby finger toothbrushes right. and I was, you know, I would put, I, I put the lick and lap treat on it. Cause that's what he likes. You know, I thought, well, I'll start with that so that he gets used to feeling. I never did it often enough. And so now you know, he's thankfully he's the kind of cat that likes to rub his teeth on me. 
You know, it's kind of, I think it's a scent thing. And so when he does, I take that opportunity to stick my finger in the side of his cheek so that I am rubbing his teeth. Now, what I got was that enzymatic toothpaste. And I was told that you really didn't need to brush it because it's working off enzymes eating the bacteria. You just kind of need to rub it on their teeth. Have you have you had any experience with that stuff? Yeah, so the in the enzymatic uh, toothpaste that are made for our pads, you're exactly right. What they're doing is um, slowing down the progression of that transformation from plaque to calculus or tartar. And mm -hmm. so I always say any, look at us, mm -hmm. we brush twice a day minimum, or a lot of people will brush after every meal. Mm -hmm. We go to the dentist twice a year. So when somebody says, what should I be doing from my pet? I go, you should be brushing after every meal they take and you should be getting their teeth cleaned twice a year. <laughs> now, exactly. You know right. that it's not feasible. <laughs> and so it becomes a discussion of, okay, so what can we logically do to help slow down What's going to naturally happen if we don't brush our teeth, we're going to see the same changes that our, our pets get. So what can we do to help? You're absolutely right. So brushing the teeth is one of the first things that we'd love everybody to do. Once a week, every day, whatever they can do, but we know it's difficult. But when we do it, it's a, a process like you said. I always start with just getting used to touching the, yeah. the mouth and then using your finger like you said and do that for a while then the finger and then depending you know in dogs you might move to a toothbrush cat usually it's a finger brush practicing the same principles don't rub the gums don't circular motion all those things are very similar teeth are teeth yeah. you know it's just the number of teeth that you know that we have and so i like those and then the next phase is you know there's oral uh, water additives that you can use to help decrease the bacteria in the mouth. You also have the advantage of their special diets. You know, there's prescription diets that are put together. You know, so most of our foods are compressed dry food wise haphazardly. So when a pet breaks in, you know, bites into them, they just shatter. Mm -hmm. There are diets out there where they specifically align the fibers. So as they bite into it, it takes more pressure and as they're biting in, those fibers are brushing the teeth. Uh, and so, and is that the difference between like the greenies treats the, the versus a temptations hard treat or something like that? Yeah, I mean, greenies, again, a lot of those are to mechanically have an impact as they're chewing, but they also have those additives in it to, to try to help decrease the bacteria and the plaque in the mouth. Mm -hmm. And so those... So it's anything that we can do safely to decrease the bacteria, decrease the plaque, just slows down the progress. We already know that it's not the end all be all because even the person who does everything their dentist tells them to do, sure, still have plaque when they go in for their dent, you know, their teeth cleaning at that six month point. I don't care what we do; it's just helping. Yeah. And you know, so I found freeze dried pheasant necks, a pheasant farm is making these for dogs. And they sent me a bunch of samples and I gave one to Pico, you know, they're, they're about yeah. yay, yay long and they're, and they're freeze dried and he's gnawing on it. And I'm like, that's perfect. Cause he's actually gnawing on it. So it's getting on the sides of his teeth and, and actually helping, I think, to, to clean the teeth. What do you think about raw bones? I mean, cooked bones, obviously splinter. So what do you think about a raw bone for a cat to gnaw on to help clean teeth? I'm never, you know, we always want to do things that help the teeth. Anything that ha has very little give, you know, when you're chewing um, can create a problem. And I think there are a lot of products out on the market that have been tested for safety and things like that, that, mm -hmm. that we can turn to. 
and ultimately, no matter what we give our pet, um, we always have to understand our pet's behavior with whatever we've chosen to give them. Because if you remember um, a few years back, there was this big thing about greenies creating obstructions because dogs were swallowing big pieces of it. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I get it. I, I, I understand that, um, that that can happen. But I think it's on us as pet owners to understand when our pets may bite off a big enough chunk and swallow it whole. Yeah. And maybe that's not the best option for dental. You know, that's when you turn to a water additive that isn't going to create a foreign body. And, and, and now, you know, everybody's starting to create things that if they do swallow it, the acid in the stomach dissolves it. So it doesn't create a problem. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I, for my, chocolate lab, I was a big fan of, um, uh, Nyla bones. Mm -hmm. The dentist would yell at me because there's not a lot of give in those Nyla bones, but he couldn't destroy them. And, you know, but I risked the, the fracturing the teeth because there is no give if you chew too hard. But I mean, I've been, he's 11 years old. And I've been getting him all his life. And I know that he tolerates them and isn't doing anything. He hasn't hurt yeah. his teeth so far, so so to speak. Um, in my cat, I couldn't brush his teeth. He mm -hmm. was the best cat in the world, but he wasn't the best veterinary patient in the world. And <laughs> um, I think and, that defines all cats in general. <laughs> exactly. And so instead of battling and trying certain things, I would do the water additive. Yeah. And then I just, uh, I'm a veterinarian, so I can do this. I would anesthetize him every year and I would have my uh, dental technician clean his teeth. Yeah, And, you know, and it was great up until he was about 11 years old. And then he started, he got the, the, the resorptive lesion and we had yeah. to extract some teeth. But again, it, it was 11 years old. So that preventative cleaning, I truly think, just like our preventative cleaning, does go a long way in helping preserve the teeth longer. And I would love to advocate everybody does a dental every year because, you know, our compliance in dentistry, as you pointed out, isn't as good as it probably should be. Um, but it can make such a big difference. And it's also important because the mouth is access for that bacteria to get into our pet systems. Yeah. And so when the bacteria is it starts to get at high levels, um, it can go to the heart and we can see bacterial, bacterial endocarditis, which is basically an infection of the heart valve. And it usually comes from the bacteria, the high bacterial count in the mouth. And then that starts to create murmurs. Um, it can get into our kidneys. It can get into the system and 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 then create other problems. So last time we talked about kidney disease, we didn't really talk about the bacteria from the mouth, yeah, uh, causing adding to the issue, but it can. And so that's why it's so important to pay attention to oral health. Um, but as veterinarians, we understand. There's fear about anesthesia. There's, you know, I've, I've always told my clients, I, ap, you know, I have had this happen where we do a dental procedure and shortly thereafter, they um, come back with kidney disease and the owners are like, I will never do another dental in my entire life. And I go, I get it. You're absolutely right. The procedure did probably push them over the edge, but please understand those kidneys were, had disease and probably more advanced disease. And the dental was enough to kind of push it to remember, I said 75% of the kidney function has to be impacted for us to see in the blood yeah. it pushed it from the 70% to the 75%. And so it appears the dental did it, but it probably wasn't the dental that caused the kidney disease and 
a lot of our older patients are the ones that are, un, are undergoing dental procedures because the mouth finally gets so bad. Now it's kind of medically necessary to give right. the pet quality of life and our cats. And, and, and so it's just this vicious cycle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, and, and, you know, they say that um, heart disease is the number one medical cause of death in cats. And do you think that, that because so few people get regular dental care for their cats, do you, how big of a role do you think that plays in that statistic? I, you know, I'm, and I'm just going to speak from my own experience. I, I don't think I would ever kind of classify poor dental health as the primary reason why we see um, heart disease in our pets. You know, I think some of it is goes to there are certain things that unless they're clinically showing symptoms, um, we may not pick up like uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats, that, that thickened heart muscle. You know, sometimes we don't know it until it's too late, but the symptoms of what happened right, you know, prior kind of leads us to know what caused it. Um, and the other thing is, it goes back to what we've talked about with cats. If we're not getting in for the annual exam and we're not picking up those progressive murmurs or we're not picking up the irregular heartbeats, it becomes harder to be proactive to try sure. to uh, slow down a, a, a process. Um, you know, so I, you know, I definitely don't want owners to leave our conversation going, oh my God, my cat's going to have heart disease if I don't go in and get a dental. But it's not a scare tactic. I want you to know, just like our teeth are important and we do our due diligence to keep them clean in the ideal world, we should be doing the same thing with our pets to help them keep teeth like we, you know, like we do. And sometimes in spite of the cleanings, things are going to happen. I mean, think about people who end up with dentures and, you know, implants and things like that. Uh, teeth take a beating. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and sadly we don't have those things for cats, right? <laughs> we don't have implants and dentures. Oh, just wait. There. <laughs> I mean, we've, put titanium canines in police dogs and oh my gosh no so uh, you know the beauty about veterinary medicine is the only limitations are you know oftentimes cost of certain yeah. you know procedures because we have at our disposal the ability to do anything on the on the human side you know root canals and all these things I mean, technically speaking, uh, we could put braces on teeth if there's malalignment. <laughs> but again, the practicality of that probably isn't there. Yeah. You know, my daughter had braces and it was a lot of visits, you know? <laughs> yeah. But but the sky's the limit. You know, I mean, it it somebody could do it if it, if somebody really wanted it to be done is is my thought process. I don't think yeah. anything's out of the realm of possibility. Who would have ever thought cats would get kidney transplants? And they do right. now. <laughs> and so again, that just shows me that you can just about do anything. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is I, I don't think we see as much dental disease in feral outdoor community cats that are eating a natural diet. You know, which is which is very interesting to me. I, we don't see as much plaque on the cats that come in, you know, because they kind of look when they're doing the spay and the neuter and the ear tip and the microchip right. and that kind of thing. And and we're not seeing as much of that as we do our indoor cats. Yeah, I I mean, I I, I won't necessarily disagree. I also think that there. So if we go back to one of the comments I made earlier, um or actually, I, I don't think I, I shared this with you. 90% of our cats are going to show dent. 90% of cats are going to show some level of dental disease um, after four years of age. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we know that one to four, we're probably not going to see too much. And if think about all the other risks that our feral cats face. Right. Cars, predators, all 
you know, all those um, entities that, you know, we're not seeing them at that typically at that five, six, seven, eight, nine years of age to identify the disease. Um, you know, and that would be my kind of my explanation with feral cats not having the dental disease when they come into the shelters. Usually they're probably fairly young and we're going to try to adopt them out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we see, I would think five, six, seven is, is, yeah. it's not uncommon at all when they're, when they're coming in, you know, right. space from the community to, to be fixed in return. Um, yeah, I always chalk it up the diet. I figure if they're eating birds again, they're, you know, they're gnawing on those bones and, and, and chewing a totally different type of food than they're eating in someone's house. And, right. and I think well, that, not, that helps. Yeah. And you and I've had that conversation about in, in cats, dry versus canned, right? Yeah. Um, so the unique thing, you know, with cats in the household and because we know kibble size makes a difference and we know the behavior of how cats eat the feral cats are having to chew and rip and 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 yeah. things are scraping the teeth for our indoor you know for our cats that are living in our homes the food is put that it doesn't require a lot of chewing necessarily right. in a cat. um you know, I still like, from a dental perspective, I prefer a dry food over a canned food. Simply thinking, dry food doesn't stick to the teeth as much as canned food does. And I think about myself, anything I eat soft gets stuck between my teeth. And, and if I'm not flossing that out, that's going to start to create a problem. And so I think of canned food the same way, you know, but it's that contradiction because we know the moisture. Right. The canned the moisture food is, yeah. It, you know, but again, it, it's depending on the system that we talk about. Sometimes it could be a, a different recommendation, um, you know, depending on the problem that we're addressing. But but I think you're right. I You know, I and that would probably be even the better explanation other than age is um, they're scrounging and they're everything's yeah. in their teeth. So that is a form of brushing the teeth that our indoor our, our in-house cats don't yeah, have just, to. Just I mean, don't we're it. Here you go. Yeah, I've I've started using the dental dry food in in the treat puzzles occasionally because, as you know, I don't I don't feed my cat dry food, but I like that whole principle that the way that it's made. The problem is he's not crazy about it. He's like eh, right. in the in the flavor that I don't. They haven't right. quite made it palatable enough for him to to really go after it yeah and you know a lot of the dental treats they tend to do spray a lot of fat you know a fat component on it to make it more appealing um and and like you that's kind of the my normal recommendation is you know i never I, I didn't routinely go hey feed this uh td for you know diet so the tooth diet from hills so you can get um good dental health you know what i would do instead is say hey this is a great treat yeah yeah you know and at least it's something you know yeah. knowing they're not going to be doing this you know brushing their teeth so right i'm with you i'm a next kitten i get i swear i'm gonna teach it to tolerate tooth brushing. I had very good intentions of that with Pico, but I just, I failed. And once you miss that window, you know, once they're, they're kind of past that little teenage window, well, you can forget it. It's, it's, it's so hard. I mean, yeah. it's pretty good. He doesn't like the flavor of those enzyme toothpaste as much as I was hoping he would. So, you know, I can, I can get him to let me brush it with, with the Vitacraft licking lap, but I don't think that's doing anything. I think that's just smearing, you know, stuff on his teeth. You know, but I think it's the, the, the mechanical removal. So yeah. I even had owners, it, it's great. The enzyme toothpaste are great. They're flavored. The The hope is that they're going to like it. And, and it does have 
something in it that slows down the progression. But I've had owners dip the brush in tuna juice. Ah. It's more the the the, the nature of okay. the brushing than needing the enzyme. Okay. It, the enzyme is great when they tolerate it, but the most important is that mechanical removal of the plaque with the bacteria on a consistent basis to prevent to slow down that progression. You're not going to ever stop it completely. Slow down the progression of calculus. Okay. The only way we're going to um, maybe not see the calculus is with frequent cl cleanings. Yeah. And again, and we've already discussed, you know, why sometimes that isn't feasible. Right. So but, bottom line is get your cat in for at least annual cleanings. How, however you can do that, um, take out a loan if you have to, but start a savings account for your cat. Get in there for those annual cleanings. Brush with whatever your cat will tolerate in its mouth. You know, tuna juice is great. And, and for Pico, the lick and lap works great for him. And again, I use the little baby finger toothbrush. So it's easy to kind of get in the back of his mouth and right. use the dental food and treats as 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 supplements to help help with that. But but clearly nothing is replacing those those cleanings, just like with us, you know. No. And, and, you know, and this is where I can, you know, kind of pat our veterinarians on the back a little bit. You know, um, we understand the cost of vet healthcare. I mean, just for all of us, we, you know, we all know insurance is not going down. It's continues right. to go. Down. But for our pets, we are sensitive to that. And so I agree, annual cleanings would be perfect. But before even that annual cleaning, Figure out with the help of your veterinarian how to get to your vet as stress free as possible. Right. So they can at least look in the mouth. And when they feel that there's something that needs to be done, like the cleaning, they're going to recommend it. Like I said, if an owner comes to me and says, I want to do a dental every year, Molly, if you came in and told me that, I'd be like, perfect. We're mm -hmm. going to help your cat's teeth the best way we can we also want you to brush and we're going to help you do that so do all that stuff but we also are realistic and so we do try to help and recommend a dental when we really do feel that there's something that needs to be addressed or cleaned or pulled or whatever the case may be we do take it seriously and and you're right i'd love every year but um but work with your veterinarian and they're going to they're going to take everything in you know that they're seeing on the exam uh and put it all together and figure out that best plan for that year uh, to to help extend your your cat's life yeah absolutely and they're living a long time these days thank goodness and so that's that's important one of my i do cat nail trims in our local community and one of my customers is he's probably 10, 12 years old, and he has one canine left, one lower canine, and that's it. All the rest of his teeth are gone, <laughs> and he he's just adorable. <laughs> well, it, it just goes to show, you know, we, uh, we, I've mentioned this before, our, our bodies are remarkable, and losing teeth, body adapts. Yeah. You know, a cat needs has a disease process that or gets you know unfortunately hits by a car and we have to remove a leg just like a person you adapt you they know adapt. and 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 that's the beauty of it you know it, yeah. it's in spite again of what we do they you know they figure it out and you know and the body's good you know if we do absolutely nothing with our teeth you know, if they can tolerate that pain, they can get through that process. Eventually, the body's going to get rid of that tooth on its own. Yeah. Exactly. Saying, okay, well, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to take care of it. You know, fortunately, yeah. veterinarians are out there to help our pets make sure that 
you know, they don't have to go through that painful process. Yeah. Yeah. This is like my father-in-law that doesn't have any teeth and won't wear his dentures. It's like, oh, well. <laughs> you know, my, my grandfather hey, hated to go to the dentist. And I, I have all the respect in the world for him because he would get a filling or if he needed a tooth extracted and he would not allow them to do anything. He would do it without any Novocaine or how oh. like. Oh, wow. And you can knock me out because I don't yeah, want to. Yeah, I'm just the opposite. I'm like, I want to be sedated <laughs> if you're cleaning them. But I don't, don't want to be around for any of that. <laughs> Absolutely. So maybe us veterinarians have it right. Just sedate them and get yeah. it over with and nobody feels anything. Exactly. <laughs> I totally agree. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you for joining us again today. And uh, it was my pleasure. Yeah, we always love these monthly talks and uh, we'll look forward to to having you again next month. And thank you everybody for, for tuning in and listening to Cat Talk Radio. And until next time, keep calm and purr on and get your cat's teeth clean.